The night began like any other at the 7-Eleven where I worked the graveyard shift. My name is Melissa, and I thought I'd seen it all, from the late night drunks to the early morning rush of cab drivers. But nothing, nothing could have prepared me for what was about to unfold. It was around 2 a.m. when he entered. A man, cloaked not just in the darkness of the night, but in the palpable tension that immediately filled the air. He locked the door behind him, and with a cold, steady voice, announced that no one would be leaving. The security cameras he revealed with a twisted pride had already been taken care of. My heart raced, but my years behind the counter had taught me to keep a cool head. There were four others in the store with me, a young couple who had been arguing over chips, a weary truck driver stacking up on coffee, and a quiet man lost in a book until that moment. The masked figure, his weapon a silent promise of violence, demanded our phones, and then, surprisingly, started what he called his experiment. He said that he knows about our darkest secrets. He knows what we fear, what we hold back, the sins of our pasts, and the worries that we hide with a smile every day. He then added that he would ask each of us some questions, questions that cut to the core of who we were or who we had been. He already knows the answers, but do we have the courage to say it in front of the others? He said that he carries a mic which is broadcasting their conversation directly to the radio station channel and being heard by thousands. There was just one rule. If we lie, we die. To the young woman, he asked, What is the lie that you live every day? Her eyes filled with tears met mine before she confessed to cheating on her husband with three other men. To her partner, he posed, What have you taken that was not yours to take? The man's face drained of color as he admitted, for the first time, to a hit and run he had committed in his youth, a secret he carried like a chain around his neck. The truck driver was next. Whose life did you ruin without ever looking back? With a heavy sigh, he revealed the story of a family business he had sabotaged to save his own, unaware of the downward spiral it caused them, leading to their suicide. And to the quiet man, engrossed in his book until our collective nightmare began, the question was, What truth do you hide behind your silence? His reply was the most shocking, a confession to embezzling funds from the non-profit he worked for, driven by desperation and shame. As each secret spilled into the open, the air in the store became heavier, suffocating. It was a psychological striptease, each revelation stripping away the layers of pretense until nothing but raw, painful truths remained. Then, it was my turn. What are you most afraid of? He asked me, his voice a blade that seemed to slice through the very fabric of my being. I thought of lying, of conjuring some trivial fear, but the weight of the confessions around me pressed me down, and I found myself speaking my truth. A fear of dying without ever having truly lived, trapped in a cycle of monotony and unfulfilled dreams. The shooter, his identity still masked, nodded, as if each confession was a piece to a puzzle only he could see. As the night dragged on, the boundary between captor and captives blurred, our secrets binding us in a macabre camaraderie. But as dawn approached, with the police surely on their way, a palpable sense of urgency took hold. It was clear this experiment was nearing its climax, and the masked figure promised one final revelation that would change everything. The tension in the air was thick as we awaited the final act of this twisted drama. The man who had terrorized us, who had peeled back the layers of our lives with his probing questions, seemed almost calm now, as if the culmination of his experiment was at hand. He turned to face us, the gun no longer the focal point of his presence. You have all revealed truths tonight. He began, his voice eerily steady. But the greatest revelation is yet to come. My heart pounded in my chest, the fear and anticipation mingling into a potent cocktail that made my head spin. What more could he possibly want from us? 
We had laid bare our darkest secrets, our deepest shames. What more was there to reveal? Then, with a flourish, he removed his mask, and the room went silent. The face that stared back at us was not that of a monster, but of a man we all recognized. Professor Gladwell, a respected figure in the community and a renowned psychologist. The real experiment, he said, his eyes alight with a fervor that bordered on madness, was to see if, when faced with extreme stress and the threat of violence, people would reveal truths they normally keep hidden, and you all passed with flying colors. The room erupted in chaos, the revelation too much to process. The young couple clung to each other, the truck driver shouted in disbelief, and the quiet man simply stared, his eyes wide with shock. Gladwell continued, undeterred by their reactions. Fear, he declared, is the most powerful motivator. It strips away the facade, revealing the essence of who we truly are. But before he could continue, the sound of sirens pierced the early morning calm, and within moments the store was swarming with police. Gladwell made no attempt to flee or resist. Instead, he surrendered with a smile, as if this was the ending he had envisioned all along. In the aftermath, as we gave our statements and the reality of our ordeal began to sink in, I felt a strange sense of clarity. Gladwell's experiment had been unethical, a violation on so many levels, but it had also forced me to confront a truth I had long denied. I didn't want to be a clerk forever, living in a fear of a life unlived. The trial that followed was a media sensation. Gladwell was deemed mentally unfit to stand trial and was committed to a mental institution, his career and reputation in ruins. The hostages, myself included, were hailed as victims of a madman's game, our personal revelations overshadowed by the sensational nature of the case. But for me, the experience marked a turning point. I quit my job at the 7-Eleven, went back to school and pursued my dream of becoming a writer, and though the memories of that night still haunt me, they also serve as a reminder of the strength I found in the face of fear. Gladwell's experiment was meant to expose our weaknesses, but instead, it revealed a resilience I never knew I had. And while I can never forgive him for what he did, I can't help but wonder if, in some twisted way, he gave me the push I needed to finally start living. The night at the 7-Eleven will forever be etched in my memory, not just as a tale of survival, but as the moment I stopped being a victim of my fears and started to confront them. Head on. The night I decided to follow the mysterious man from the 7-Eleven, my life changed forever. It was a decision born out of curiosity, a need to understand why, every month at exactly 8 p.m., this stranger would come in and purchase three seemingly unrelated items, a lighter, a pack of salt, and a single candle. My colleagues had told me tales of his visits, how they coincided with unexplained power outages and a chill that would sweep through the store. The man always came once every 30 days, bought his stuff, then met the shady store manager in his office and left. My colleagues joked about it, but their laughs never quite reached their eyes. I was the new guy, Lou, the one who hadn't yet learned to stay behind the counter and mind my own business. On that fateful night, I watched as he made his purchases and walked out into the dark. My curiosity got the better of me and I followed him, keeping my distance as we ventured deeper into the heart of the town. The streets were deserted, the only sound of my footsteps echoing against the pavement and the distant howl of the wind. He led me to the outskirts of town, to a clearing that I never knew existed. The moon hung low in the sky, casting an eerie light over the scene. The man began some sort of ritual, arranging the items he had bought in a precise pattern on the ground. He started chanting in a strange, ancient language I couldn't understand, his voice steady and mesmerizing. It could have well been Old Spanish or native Indian lingo, but I was clueless to it. 
I hid behind a tree, watching, my heart racing with a mix of fear and excitement. Then, I made a mistake. I stepped on a branch and it snapped under my foot with a sound that shattered the silence like glass. The man turned sharply, his eyes finding mine in the darkness. There was a flash of anger, and then a profound sadness. I don't know how he did it, but he just vanished before my eyes, leaving me alone in the clearing, the chill of the night subtly more biting than before. I didn't understand what I had done, but I felt it in my bones, a mistake that had irrevocable consequences. I hurried back to the 7-Eleven, my mind racing, trying to convince myself it was all a product of my imagination. But the town had changed. Shadows moved with a life of their own, whispering threats and voices only I could hear. The street lights flickered as I passed, plunging me into darkness before flaring back to life. I felt like I was being hunted, chased by something I had inadvertently unleashed. I made it back to the 7-Eleven, panting and drenched in sweat, but the store was different, the air thick with an unspoken terror. My colleagues were gone, and in their place were shadows that watched me with hungry eyes. I barricaded myself in the office, panicking, and that is when I heard my manager's voice who was sitting alone in the dark. He spoke of a guardian, a being that protected our town from something ancient and malevolent. The items the man bought were part of a ritual to keep the darkness at bay, a ritual I had interrupted. As he spoke further, the reality of my situation sank in. I was alone, in a town overrun by nightmares, with no knowledge of how to reverse what I had done. The night stretched on, an endless parade of horrors that tested the limits of my sanity. Shadows whispered my name, and black formless creatures of darkness pressed against the windows, their red eyes gleaming with malice. I was in a living nightmare, and dawn seemed an eternity away. The night wore on, each minute stretching into what felt like hours. As I huddled in the cramped office of the 7-Eleven with the manager, whose quiet and aloofness we had all taken for being strange and shady, and then I learned his reason. He was aware of the darkness, the mysterious man and his rituals. He held all of these secrets inside of him. And then something happened. A tall shadow entered inside, and with swiftness rushed to the manager. He convulsed, his eyes rolled up, and he was lifted off his feet into the air, possessed. I was freaking out, but the manager fought the evil, yelling the same thing on repeat, almost like a mantra. Light repels the darkness. It seemed overly simplistic, but desperation lends weight to even the most cliché of adages. I remembered the items the mysterious man always bought. A lighter, a pack of salt, and a candle. They were tools of protection, elements to ward off whatever now lurked in the shadows. Armed with this knowledge, I ran to the store, picked up a lighter, a candle, and salt. With these items in hand, I set about to the room, my hands trembling as I placed the candle in the center of the and circled it with salt, just like I had seen that mysterious man do. The moment I lit the candle, the oppressive darkness seemed to recoil, and my manager fell back on his feet. The whispers grew frantic, angry, and the shadows at the window surged forward, only to be repelled by the barrier of salt. It was working, but I knew it was a temporary measure. The candle would not burn forever, and the salt could not hold back the darkness indefinitely. That is when I received a text from an unknown number which spoke of a heart of light and words of sealing. For some reason, I knew exactly the man who had sent it. I interpreted this as needing to strengthen the ritual's core, the candle's flame, with something personal. I took a deep breath, focusing on my desire to protect, to undo my mistake. Then, speaking words of apology and hope, I used my own breath to fan the flame. It was a shot in the dark, but the candle flared brightly as opposed to burning off. The effect was immediate and dramatic. The shadows screamed, a sound of fury and pain, as the light washed over them, dissolving them into nothingness. 
the whispers died away and the darkness retreated, beaten back by a single candle's light. I maintained the ritual until the first light of dawn crept through the windows. As the sun rose, the normal sounds of the town returning felt like music to my ears. The darkness had been banished, the town saved from a night of terror, but the cost, the cost was etched deep into my soul. I stepped outside, the morning light warm on my face, a stark contrast to the cold dread of the night. The town looked the same, but I saw it with new eyes. I had faced the darkness, both the one I had unleashed and the one within myself. The mysterious man never returned to the 7-Eleven, and I never learned his name, but I kept up the ritual, month after month. It was my penitence, my responsibility now. The town remained safe under my watch, but I knew the darkness was always there, lurking at the edges, waiting for another chance to seep in. I realized later that the true horror wasn't the darkness of the creatures it hid, it was the ease with which a single act of curiosity could unravel the safety of an entire town. I was scarred, forever changed by a night of unspeakable terror, but I had survived, and in that survival, I found a purpose.